Welcome to this presentation on how to write standards. These slides were developed by editors at the ISO Central Secretariat, and we hope it provides a good overview of how to draft a standard correctly um, and gives you some ideas on the uh, rules um, that you have to follow when drafting standards. If you have any questions about the content uh, after you've watched it, you can contact your editorial programme manager for your committee. If you're not sure who that is, you can easily find this information on iso.org if you search for that committee. As far as possible, we've taken all the examples from the RICE model, which is a fictitious standard, um, and I will mention that a bit more in just a few minutes. Resources for writing standards. The main resource is the ISO IEC Directives Part 2. This is where you'll find all the drafting and editorial rules for ISO deliverables um, as well as IEC documents. Um, we have um, a number of other uh, publications that go along with that, but that is the, the document where you'll actually find all the official rules. You'll find the ISO IC Directives Part 2 on the ISO website. So again, that's iso.org. And then if you see this page here under the, um, under the tag uh, take part, Taking Part, um, if you go to the bottom of the page, you'll see a link there, which is to the Directives Part 2. And that will open up the directives for you. We have a number of other resources for people writing standards, as well as the directives part two. If you visit iso.org and you go again to the taking part tab, and then you go to resources, you'll find a page called drafting standards. Here you'll find um, a brochure called how to write standards. As it says, this gives tips for standards writers. For example, how to structure your document correctly, and what you can and cannot put into um, certain clauses or elements of a standard. We also have the RICE model. The RICE model is a fictitious standard um, about RICE. Um, it shows as many as possible um, examples that you might find in a real standard. For example, how to reference bibliographical references in the text, how to put in a proper table, what, what a, an acceptable figure would look like, um, some examples of annexes. And we also have an amendment to that RICE model standard so that you can see how an amendment uh, should be drafted. As well as these three resources, we have um, some best practices for vocabularies and terminologies. Uh, this is also where you'll find the simple template, which is your starting point when drafting a standard and some other templates, and also guidelines for the submission of text and graphics to ISOCS. This is a very useful page, um, and we also, um, we might be adding to this page in future with other drafting resources. So you can always keep an eye on that page. The simple template is an example document which has some generic information already inserted so that you can then fill in the gaps. So you'll see it includes um, a, a title page. It includes uh, the forward. So you can see that the general, the generic information is there. And then it shows you uh, where you need to fill in the gaps, for example, differences between one edition and the next and perhaps the information about which committee developed the standard. Then it carries on to the body of the document so you have the scope and then for the normative references and the terms and definitions you'll find that the generic text is already there so you then only have to fill in the parts that are specific to your document. The template also includes an annex, which um, shows you how an annex might be drafted. And within that annex, we have a figure, 
so you can see how the figure title and the key um, are drafted uh, in, in, in respect to the figure. And also, of course, we include a table, so you can easily see uh, how to construct uh, a table. So the template has a number of styles, and it's very useful um, for you to have these styles already, already made, if you like, in your document. And that will save you a lot of time and effort um, because you have auto numbering and things like that to help you with your drafting. There is also uh, in Annex A of the Directives Part 2, you'll find this checklist. Uh, this was added in the most recent edition of the Directive Part 2. And when you submit a document to ISO, you may find it helpful to um, use this checklist and go through it and make sure that your document that you are about to submit complies with all of these, um, all of these rules. So, for example, um, checking that your title um, is the title organized going from the more general to the more particular? Is it clear and concise? Um, things like adding the correct forward information. So this um, checklist just really helps you make sure that you've put in all the necessary information to save time um, as we go forwards in the process. We'll be talking a little bit about ISO language. So first of all, we'll talk a bit about plain language. It's very important that standards are written in a way that is easy to understand. So we'll go into a bit more detail about that. We will also talk about the verbal forms that we use in ISO standards. It's important to understand that if you want to um, give a requirement, then you use the word shall. If you want to give a recommendation, it is should. And if you want to give permission, you use may. And it's very important that uh, the user of the standard knows what they have to do in order to comply with the standard. So these verbal forms are very important. We will also mention this document. This is the phrase that you need to use in the document to refer to the document itself. So plain language, the benefits of using plain language are essentially that um, a document that is written in plain language um, is quicker and easier to read and it's also quicker and easier to write if you don't need to worry about embellishing your language which can cause um, misinterpretation you have to remember that iso standards are used by people all over the world many of whom um, english is not their native language so um, it's really good if we can make it as easy to understand as possible so, as I said, using plain language avoids misinterpretation. It also reduces discussion and the time and cost of drafting the standard. It helps you to convey your message effectively. So, just to give you some tips of writing plain language and putting this into practice, you should always think of your reader. When you're writing, you put yourself in the place of the person that's reading the standard and ask yourself, do I understand? Is this clear what I'm saying? As far as possible, you should be concise using short sentences and simple words. And a good rule of thumb is to have one idea per sentence. You can also remove any unnecessary words and use lists. This is really helpful. Instead of having a long paragraph, you can instead just use bullet points. And that's much easier for people to read and gets your message across much more effectively. Also consider using the active voice. So instead of saying the test tube is placed in the apparatus, you can just say place the test tube in the apparatus. And that would um, that has the same meaning, but it's much more direct. Also consider your use of punctuation. So if you're using short sentences, use full stops rather than huge long sentences with lots of commas. We like to use very specific verbal forms. 
because this helps us um, avoid uh, misunderstandings and makes it absolutely unequivocal to people using technical standards that um, a certain part of the standard is a requirement or a recommendation or permission. It's very important to make these distinctions. So if you want to give a requirement, you use the word shall. If you want to make a recommendation, you use the word should. If you want to give permission, you use the word may. And for possibility and capability, use the word can. These last two, may and can, are most frequently mixed up. Um, I would say it's slightly less important to, um, to emphasise the, the difference between may and can. It's really important that you um, use shall for requirements and should for recommendations. But may and can are two distinct things and if possible you should only use the word may when you're giving permission. So, be clear about what is a requirement and what is a recommendation or another type of statement. Do not use other verbal forms such as must or have to. Um, we find that this is quite ambiguous and if you use must, the, the reader of the standard isn't sure whether they have to apply that requirement to a standard or whether it's just a recommendation. So it's very important not to use must or have to. Then we have the use of this document. For an individual document, the form this document should be used throughout. So if you look at the introduction in this example, it says, this document was developed in response to worldwide demand for minimum specifications for rice. So when we refer to this document, we know that it is always referring to the document that we are using at this time. So all documents now have this fixed structure. We start with the scope. The scope is always clause one. Then we have the normative references, which are clause two, and terms and definitions in clause three. And this structure applies even if you have no normative references and even if you have no terms and definitions. And I will show you some examples of um, such cases in just a moment. So here we go. The usual case, most documents do have normative references. So you would have, as shown here on the left, the following documents are referred to in the text in such a way that some or all of their content constitutes requirements of this document. For dated references, only the edition cited applies. For undated references, the latest edition of the reference document, including any amendments, applies. And then we have a list of the documents that are normatively referenced in that document. If we don't have any normative references, we make no um, normative citation to any other document uh, within our own document. Or for instance, if you're writing a technical report which has no requirements in it, it's a purely informative document. In that case, you still have a clause two for normative references, but instead of the text in the first case, you would simply add a sentence saying, there are no normative references in this document. For terms and definitions, it's the same principle. So we have our generic text here. For the purposes of this document, the following terms and definitions apply. ISO and IEC maintain terminological databases for use in standardization at the following addresses. And then we give the two addresses of our databases where we keep um, all of our terms and definitions. But in cases where you have no terms and definitions to list, you replace the first bit of the generic text with no terms and definitions are listed in this document. But then you would still always keep this um, generic text about our terminological databases. <laughs> 
that it has a maximum of three elements. So it will have an introductory element, which in this case is serials and pulses. It will have a main element, which here is specification and test methods. And then a complementary um, element, which is in this case part one, rice. If you have a multi-part standard, which is the case here, you, your, the part name, the part number, would always be the complementary element of that uh, title. So you can't have three elements to your title and then the part title. The third, the third element would always have to be the part title. But as you'll see in just a minute, you don't have to have three elements. Three is the maximum. You can have just one element or you can have two elements. So here we have some examples. So the first example is ISO 26000, Guidance on Social Responsibility. So that is just one element in the title because it's very clear what is contained in that document. We know that it's a guidance document and we know that it's about social responsibility. The second example is um, a two element title. So that's ISO 9001, which you all may know. Quality management systems requirements. So here we have, um, um, we know that this document is about quality management systems and specifically it gives requirements. So you might have another document which is called quality management systems vocabulary. Um, so you have, um, you can see the use there of the two elements. And then in the final example, we have another three element title robots and robotic devices, safety requirements for industrial robots, part two, robot systems and integration. So the domain that this document falls into is robots and robotic devices. Um, and then the, the main element is the safety requirements for industrial robots. But you see, you might have safety requirements for industrial robots um, pertaining to something very specific. So here they've seen that it's necessary to specify that it's uh, in the domain of robots and robotic devices. It should also reflect the scope. So there should be no contradiction between the scope and the title. And it should also be consistent with titles of related documents. So often um, we'll have um, documents produced by the same technical committee um, and so any of the vocabulary that's used in those titles should, should be the same. A good example is healthcare. For example, healthcare can be written as one word, it can be written with a hyphen or it can be written as two words. So it should always be aligned with other documents uh, in the series or produced by the same technical committee. Um, that's very important so always keep um, keep things aligned. The table of contents is something that you actually really don't have to worry about. It's generated automatically, so uh, whatever you do in your table of contents um, is absolutely has no bearing on what will come out on the final PDF. Um, it, it goes down to three levels. So, um, for example, you can see here 651 and 652. If you had subclauses below that level, they would not show up in the table of contents. We also do not include uh, lists of figures or tables in the table of contents. As you can imagine, it might get very long if we if we did that um, in all cases. This brings us to the forward. The forward is present in all ISO documents and it gives general information about um, the drafting of the standard, um, the rules that it complies with, and it gives some information about um, um, technical barriers to trade and conformity assessment at this link here at the bottom. Now all of this section is uh, generic. So um, 
we will always add that um, if you have not included it. Then the part at the end is the specific part, and this is where um, the technical committee should really add this information into the document before uh, submitting it to ISO Central Secretariat. So this gives the revision information, so you can see who prepared the document. If it revises a previous edition of that document, this is where that information would be given. And we also mention here that um, if there's a multi-part standard, that we say that the list of all the parts in that series can be found on the ISO website. In the past, we used to um, actually give a list of the other parts, but obviously that, um, that can go out of date uh, quite soon. So it's better to just say that there's a list of parts and then people can go and visit the website and find out what those other parts are. So um, those are the only things that need to be mentioned. If you have patents in your document, uh, if there is mention of patents, that information should go in the introduction. And if you have any questions about that, you should really direct them to your uh, technical program manager for your committee. As you know, standards are voluntary documents and they're intended to be used as widely as possible. For that reason, uh, they shall not include any statements intended to limit their purpose or use. For example, statements on um, that could create barriers or obstacles to trade. Um, and we don't uh, mention certification. We don't say in our standards that something must be certified. Um, because this goes against the principles of uh, conformity assessment. And we'll mention that again a bit later on. Also, contractual requirements. We can't mention contractual requirements in an ISO standard as these are voluntary documents. And we cannot include any legal, regulatory or statutory requirements. We cannot tell users of a standard that they shall comply with uh, locally applicable laws or regulations because we assume that they, the standards users, will always obey national laws anyway. So it makes no difference that um, an ISO standard, which is voluntary, specifies that because it's already assumed. So please don't include any legal, regulatory or statutory requirements. Conformity assessment and uh, CASCO. CASCO is the Committee for Conformity Assessment, which you may know. Um, they deal with, um, well, as I said, they deal with conformity assessment. So whenever we see words in a standard such as accreditation, certification, verification, these um, will give us a warning. They'll throw up an automatic warning so that we can check um, that um, this document is not um, stating that something has to be verified by a third party, for example. And if the ISO editor is in doubt and they're not sure what to do, they will always check with the, um, the CASCO team who are based here at ISO Central Secretariat. And we will always discuss that with you before removing any text from your standard. Um, the forward, the specific information in the forward, it says that um, this document was prepared by Technical Committee TC34. SC4, and then it says that it was cance it cancels and replaces the first edition, which has been technically revised. And then um, you should give a list of the main changes from that previous edition to the current edition, so that anyone using the standard they can see exactly what has been updated from the previous version. When you have a minor revision. Um, the text will be as follows. It will say this fourth edition cancels and replaces the third edition of which it constitutes a minor revision. And again, then you would give some indication of how it has been revised. So in this case, it has been revised to adjust tolerances and geometry in figures one and two and to clarify the use of scale and micrometer.
The introduction is not a mandatory part of a standard, but we do recommend that you include an introduction because it can be very useful for um, anyone who is using your standard. So the intention of the introduction is to give uh, background information. So as you can see from this example from the RICE model, it says this document was developed in response to worldwide demand for minimum specifications for RICE traded internationally. So it's giving a reason why the standard was developed, a reason for its existence, if you like. So as I said, the, <laughs> the introduction is optional, but it is encouraged. It gives background information or commentary, and it should always be concise. So there are many cases where we see introductions that go on for um, several pages, and this probably is not that useful. Um, we always say to keep it as concise as possible. And it should not overlap with the scope. So it shouldn't be saying what you would expect to find in the scope. Um, and likewise, the scope shouldn't give a load of background information. You should create an introduction for that purpose. It should have no requirements. This is a purely informative part of the document. So you should not have any requirements um, and use the word shall in your introduction. Important part of the standard. As I said before, the scope is one of the mandatory elements um, and it's always clause one. This is where you show your user what the standard does effectively and to what it's applicable. So in this example, it says this document specifies minimum requirements and test methods for RICE. So the user knows straight away what this document is for. Then it goes on to say it is applicable to husked rice, husked parboiled rice, etc. And it is not applicable to cooked rice products. So the user of the standard has a very good idea um, straight away from these three short sentences what the standard is used for and whether it is or is not applicable to their needs. As I said, the scope is a mandatory element explaining what the standard does. It should always be concise and give the applicability of the standard. And it only uses statements of fact, which means you must not have any requirements, recommendations or permissions anywhere in the scope. If you do, the editor will find that and will come back to you and suggest a way to reword it so that you only have statements of fact. The normative references clause, um, as I said, this is also part of the fixed structure, so it will always be clause two. And it is reserved for documents referred to in the text in such a way that some or all of their content constitutes requirements of the standard. So you have, for example, shall, Sampling shall be carried out in accordance with ISO 24333. So this means that is a normative reference because you're, it constitutes um, a requirement of the standard. Or equivalent normative language. So here you have an example of the active voice. Determine the husked rice yield in accordance with ISO 6646. So it's clear from that example that the user of this standard must have or shall have ISO 6646 um, in order to apply the standard. So again, that would be a normative reference that you would list in clause two. Generic text up here and a list of normative references. But how do we know that these are normative? We always have to look in the text to find out how they are cited in order to make a decision on whether they qualify as normative references or not. So to give you one example, the mass fraction of moisture determined in accordance with ISO 712 shall not be greater than 15%. So in order to determine the mass fraction of moisture, the user of the standard 
really needs to have ISO 712. And that's why it is listed here in the normative references clause. Then another example, if bags are used, they shall comply with the requirements of ISO 8351 Part 1, 1994, Clause 9, or ISO 83512 as appropriate. So in this case, the user must have um, the, uh, the bags in compliance with this standard here. And here you'll see it gives a specific citation to Clause 9 of that standard. And for that reason, this one must be listed um, with a date. So because it's the 1994 edition that you're specifically referring to, then you must include the date in the normative references clause. So to recap, clause two is always for normative references. Any references that are not cited in a normative manner are listed in the bibliography. And these would normally be ISO and IEC documents in the normative references. You can normative, normatively reference other documents, um, but in general, they are usually ISO and IEC documents. They must always be publicly available so any user of your standard must be able to obtain that standard. Otherwise, they, to obtain that document that is normatively referenced, otherwise they won't be able to correctly apply your standard. And if you don't have any normative references, you simply use the generic text. There are no normative references in this document. We use the same example. If bags are used, they shall comply with the requirements of ISO 8351 Part 1, 1994, Clause 9, or ISO 8351 Part 2, as appropriate. So because you're referring to a specific element, that Clause 9, in a subsequent edition of ISO 8351 Part 1, it may no longer be Clause 9. So it's really important that you um, specify that it's the 1994 edition of that standard. The reference to ISO 8351 Part 2 does not refer to a specific element, so that one does not need to be dated when you list it. And please remember that this rule about dated and undated references applies to all references, whether they're normative in Clause 2 or informative in the bibliography. This is an example of a bibliography. As you can see, it's just a list of documents. We normally structure the bibliography in a numerical order. So you would start with the ISO standards and put those in numerical order. Then you would put IEC standards, also in numerical order. And then you would, um, if you have any, you would use then regional standards or um, national standards after those. So if you, for example, had um, an ANSI standard or a BSI standard, that would come after uh, any ISO or IEC standards and after any SEN standards, for example. And then following those, you would add any literature references that you have. So, for example, journals or conferences. Um, you can find guidelines for bibliographic references, so um, how to uh, reference them in the text, um, you can find that in ISO 690. But you should always avoid listing too many references. Um, a bit like the introduction, we sometimes see uh, bibliographies that are very, very long, running into hundreds of documents, and this uh, we really don't think is very useful for people using that standard. So. If possible, you should restrict it to documents that are actually mentioned or cited in the document. And when you are citing these documents, 
Um, this is an example of how you should do that in the text. So if you want to refer to reference 12, well, first of all, you can always refer to ISO and IEC documents just by their, their names because, or by their numbers because they will be hyperlinked in the text. But for other documents, um, you should refer to them by their reference number in the bibliography. So here you see, for details on the determination of protein content using the Kjeldahl method, see reference 12 in the bibliography. For details concerning the use of the DUMAS method, see references 10 and 16. Then the user can just click on those and they will get taken straight to those documents in the bibliography. And because these are reference, these are given um, as part of a sentence, they are given in this way um, on the line, whereas in this example just below, it says um, calculate the crude protein content by multiplying the value of the nitrogen content by the conversion factor specified in ISO 20483 that is adapted to the type of cereals or pulses and to their use. So here the reference isn't really given as part of the sentence, so you would put it as a superscript um, in the place where, it, where it's applicable. So again, you can find this example in the RICE model. Here is an example of a terminological entry in an ISO standard. And this is where the defined term is used within the text. So your term is gelatinization time. And that term is used in 6.4 where it says, determine the gelatinization time for rice kernels during cooking. And this shows how the, the term should replace the definition in context. So in this example, if I did not define the term gelatinization time, I could instead just write it the way it's defined. So I could say, determine the time necessary for 90% of the kernels to pass from their natural state to the gel state. So that is the definition of gelatinization time. So I hope that gives an, a good example of how the definition replaces a term in context. You should be able to replace the term by the definition and it should still make sense. Here's another example, extraneous matter. And you'll see the uh, rice there is between triangle brackets. So if there is more than one meaning for a term, you use separate entries with triangle brackets to show the domain with which that is used. So if you had extraneous matter pertaining to something else, something other than rice that was also defined, you would then use triangle brackets to show the different meanings of extraneous matter. So without exception, clause three is always for terms and definitions. And they should be classified according to a hierarchy of concepts, if possible. This means that um, you would start with more general terms and you would group together terms that are related to each other we really try to avoid um, listing terms in alphabetical order. The main reason is because when you translate a document from English into another language, the terms and definitions must always have the same number. They must always be the same designation. So your list of, of terms and definitions in another language would actually be in a completely random order. So if you class them in a hierarchy of concepts, then at least they're related to each other because their meaning is the same, regardless of what language you're in. So you should define terms that are necessary for the understanding of the document. So that means do not uh, define terms that are self-explanatory or things that you would just find in a regular dictionary. 
and you can find best practices with the vocabularies and terminologies on the drafting page that I showed you earlier. They, ret they replace the term in context, so do not include any article such as a, an, any, or all. And also they do not have any punctuation because they are just um, definitions. You should also avoid circular definitions. So if we are defining extraneous matter, a circular definition would be matter that, has ex that is extraneous. So while it kind of defines the term, it doesn't help the user at all. It doesn't give any meaning. It does not really define the term. And you should also avoid equations, figures and tables um, within a terminological entry. And remember that definitions cannot contain requirements, recommendations or permissions. If you're using a note to entry after your definition, you can in that you can give requirements, recommendations or permissions that pertain to the use of that term. But the definition itself should not contain any uh, requirements, recommendations or permissions. So here we see the introductory text. For the purposes of this document, the following terms and definitions apply. This bit of text is variable. This can be changed according to what you have in your terms and definitions clause. The square, the box below it, is not variable that you have in all cases. When it comes to the introductory text for terms and definitions, you have a number of options. I'm sorry that this slide looks quite full, but um, it does actually give a lot of useful information. So if you do have terms and definitions in your document, you would say, for the purposes of this document, the following terms and definitions apply. Or if you want to refer to terms and definitions in another document, you would say, the terms and definitions given in ISO 17301 part one apply. And remember that in this case, that would make ISO 17301 part one a normative reference because the user of the standard needs to have it in order to know the terms and definitions that apply to this document. Or if you have terms and definitions and you want to refer to uh, terms and definitions in another document, you'd use the third option, the terms and definitions given in ISO 17301 part one and the following apply. If you have no terms and definitions, you would use the sentence, no terms and definitions are given in this document. But then in all cases, you follow it with the generic text um, showing that ISO and IEC maintain terminological databases for use in standardization. And then you give the, the addresses of the OBP and the Electropedia. In the document, if there are very few abbreviated terms, um, and there are no terms and definitions listed, you can simply give the abbreviation in the text. This is the easiest way to do it. So in this first example, this document specifies a method for calibrating the magnification of images generated by a scanning electron microscope, SEM. So that's the first place that the SEM is mentioned in the text. So that's the appropriate place to give the abbreviation. If you do have abbreviated terms in your standard and they are related to terms that are defined in clause three, then you can do it, for example, um, like here, where it says HDK, um, and that is the abbreviation for a heat damaged kernel. If it's the case that you always refer to it as an HDK rather than using the full term heat damaged kernel, then it's perfectly acceptable to actually define the abbreviation first if that is the way that it's always consistently referred to. Or if there are many abbreviated terms throughout the document, it might be a better idea to actually use a separate clause um, to give all these abbreviated terms. And then it's much easier for your user to just go back and refer to that clause of abbreviated terms 
um, rather than having to search for them in the document. I briefly mentioned the online browsing platform before, but this is um, a repository of uh, terms and definitions published in ISO standards. So whenever we publish an ISO standard, the terms and definitions are fed automatically through XML into the online browsing platform so that um, anyone who is uh, involved in standardization or actually anyone in the world, because um, it's completely public, can search for terms that are <clears throat> that are defined in ISO standards. This uh, prevents us having lots of different definitions for the same thing. So people can search to find if something has already been defined and to see if they find an appropriate definition for a term. And then they can just use that instead of redefining something um, and reinventing the wheel over and over again. And it contains not just terms and definitions, it contains the front sections of ISO standards. So if you click on um, an ISO standard, for example, ISO 17301 part one, you will then uh, have access uh, to its table of contents, the forward, the introduction, the scope, the normative references, the terms and definitions, and the bibliography. But all of the normative text in between those sections will not be uh, visible unless you subscribe or you buy that standard. And you can search uh, a number of ways. You can search either by the standard number or you can search terms and definitions and also graphical symbols and country codes. And there are various filters that you can use. For example, um, you can search in different languages. You can search for uh, documents published by a particular uh, committee or published in a particular year, for example. If you have symbols in your document um, related to defined terms, and there are not very many, um, rather like the abbreviations, you can simply um, include those uh, in the terms and definitions rather than having a separate clause. Um, but if you do have a lot of symbols throughout your document with lots of equations and things, uh, it might be better to um, put those in a separate clause um, which then the user of the standard can easily refer back to. And if you like, you can combine it with abbreviated terms. So you can have a clause for, uh, which would be called symbols and abbreviated terms. You would list this in alphabetical order um, and you'd put the Latin before the Greek. So there's just an example um, of how you might list symbols in a clause, um, in a symbols clause. Symbols and units in your standard, they must all be, um, they must all comply with the international system of units, the SI units. Variables should be written in italic and Greek letters. And the um, decimal, we don't use a decimal point, we use a decimal comma, and we separate thousands by spaces rather than by commas. If your standard contains annexes, um, I'll give you a little bit of information how to use annexes. So a normative annex um, would normally contain um, additional requirements, for example, a mandatory test method, uh, whereas an informative annex um, would be something optional um, that the user does not have to apply. And when deciding whether an annex is informative or normative, um, you need to look at how it is referenced in the main body of the document to determine that. You don't just decide, well, I think this is normative, or no, I think this is informative. It's all to do with how it is referenced in the text. So if in the text you say that um, um, Annex A shall be applied, then that is what determines whether it is normative or not. And I'll show you a couple of examples. So here we see in um, subclause 422, 
the defect tolerance for the categories considered and determined in accordance with the method given in Annex A shall not exceed the limits given in Table 1. So the user of the standard needs to determine the defect tolerance in accordance with Annex A. So Annex A is definitely normative. Then we have another example. Determine the mass fraction of waxy rice. Annex B gives an example of a suitable method. So if Annex B is only giving an example, we can't then say that Annex B is normative. It is purely informative. So Annex B would be informative. However, it's important to remember that even if an annex is informative, it can still contain requirements. Those requirements would only apply if the user of the standard decides to use that annex. If they apply that annex, then the requirements are obligatory, but they don't have to uh, apply that annex, so the annex is still informative. So for example, sampling shall be carried out in accordance with clause 5. This is a requirement in Annex B, which we've already decided is an informative annex. So that requirement only applies if the user decides to apply Annex B. It has a title, Table 1, Maximum Permissible Mass Fraction of Defects. It has a header, a header row, so defect and then maximum permissible mass fraction of defects. It has a body, that's where all your information is given that, that you want to give in that table. And then this particular one has a footer row. So in the footer row, you have um, a requirement. Uh, you may not always have a requirement in a table. Then you have notes and then you have footnotes. The difference between notes and footnotes is that notes apply to the whole table and they are informative, whereas footnotes are, um, they pertain to something specific in the table and you can uh, include requirements in a footnote. So for example, um, if we look at footnote C, so here we've got footnote C and that says the maximum permissible mass fraction of defects shall be determined with respect to the mass fraction obtained after milling. So that footnote does contain a requirement. Figures follow very similar rules to tables. So here we have the figure. We have a key. We've got some units that are used in that figure. We have a little requirement there. Again, like the table, you probably won't have a requirement in a figure, but this is just to show that you can if you want to. There's a figure note and some figure footnotes, and they follow the same rules as for tables. So the note would apply to the whole figure, whereas the footnotes apply to a specific element within the figure. And you also have a figure title. All figures must have a title. We have figure C2. So the figure title is at the bottom, below the entirety of the figure. And then we have three sub-figures, each with their own figure subtitle. You should always avoid using text in line drawings. This is so that um, they can be easily translated. If you have figures with lots of uh, text in them and you then want to go and translate it, then it means that the figure has to also be translated and a figure is a separate file from the text. So it just uh, makes it a slightly more complicated process. So wherever possible, you should use symbols. So here we've got the axes are marked X and Y and then those are defined in the key. And also the lines that show what the different things mean, 
they're also given in the key rather than in the drawing itself. The exception to the language rule is, of course, flowcharts, because they have to contain text. So if you want to use flowcharts, you can. And you can find more information on flowcharts in ISO 5807. If you have um, reproduced a figure from another source, uh, you must obtain permission for this, and you need to um, give that permission or show that permission to the technical program manager of your committee. And then you should also add some acknowledgement um, that the figure is reproduced from another source. So this is an example of how you might do that. So you would put a note saying the image source and that it's reproduced with permission. But if you have any cases like this, you can always ask uh, for help from your TPM or from your EPM, your ed editorial program manager. So I just want to give you a few examples of best practice when it comes to drafting figures. First of all, you should be clear and concise. So avoid cluttering up your figures with lots of small details that aren't necessary. Also try to be consistent. We see many documents where the, um, there are several figures in the document and they look different. They've obviously been drawn in different places or taken from different sources. Um, and it's much better if you can try and make all your figures look, uh, look similar and, and be aligned in terms of um, how they're drawn. Please send your figures to ISO CS um, as soon as possible, um, separately from the draft. And all the figures should be in revisable format. Um, and if that uh, is something you're not sure about, you can also always consult the guidelines for submission of text and graphics, which is on the drafting page that I showed you earlier. The reason we like to have revisable files is so that we can edit them easily without having to send them back to the committee for correction. And it also means that we have them then on file. So in future editions of your standard, um, you won't necessarily need to submit new figure files because we will already have them. Graphical symbols. These are some examples of some ISO graphical symbols. Um, it's very important that if you include uh, graphical symbols um, in your documents, you need to check that you have done this. Um, so if you need a graphical symbol, you can search for graphical symbols on the online browsing platform. And if you need to create a new graphical symbol, you need to register that and you need to contact ISO TC 145, which is responsible for the coordination and registration of graphical symbols. Some instructions for this are um, available on ISO Connect, but if you have um, any questions, you should contact your TPM. The text of an ISO standard is divided into clauses, subclauses, and paragraphs. And you should always have at least two subclauses at the same level. So if you look at this example here, we have clause four, and then under clause four, we have subclauses four one, four two, and four three. And then under four three, we have further subclauses four three one and four three two. And you'll see that four one, four two, and four three all have um, a title. So if you have a title of a subclause, you must also have titles for any other subclauses at the same level. Alternatively, you can have subclauses without a title, um, but if you have them without a title, again, any other subclauses at the same level must also not have a title. So this example here shows the two ways of um, doing your subclauses with or without a title. <laughs> 
here's an example of a note and an example. So um, the note says lower mass fractions of moisture are sometimes needed for certain destinations, depending on the climate, duration of transport and storage. For further details, see ISO 6322 parts 1, 2 and 3. So you can see that this is just um, supplementary information that has been put in a note. You can't have any normative uh, text or any requirements or recommendations or permissions in a note. And the example um, can be just a list. It doesn't have to be a full sentence. So here you've just got vehicle speed, throttle angle, um, etc. And again, examples are just examples. You cannot have any requirements, recommendations or permissions. So they give additional information. Um, notes and examples assist the understanding and the use of the document. But in theory, you can use the document without them. So they are completely informative. They have no requirements, recommendations or permissions. And they should be placed after the paragraph to which they refer. And if you have two or more in the same clause, table or figure, you should number them. So you can use A and B lists and then you can have nested lists within a list, which you would then use something else like one and two. <clears throat> and you can also have unnumbered lists. So you just use the dashes instead of numbering them. But you shouldn't have more of more than one of the same type of list in any uh, clause or subclause. So as I mentioned earlier, um, in Annex A of the Directives Part 2, you'll find um, this very useful checklist. So you can see on there whether you've done everything correctly before you submit your document to ISO CS. This brings us to the end of our course on how to write standards. I hope you found it informative. If you have any questions on the content that we've covered, um, please don't hesitate to contact the editorial programme manager for your committee. As I said at the beginning, you can find out who that is um, on your committee page on the ISO website. Um, alternatively, you can always visit the drafting page on ISO.org. So thank you very much for your attention.